Welcome back to my series on chess opening theory. In this video, I'm going to be taking a look at the Schlechter sideline in the French defense. So the French defense is when we have the moves e4, e6, d4, d5. And the Schlechter variation is when white now plays bishop to d3. Now previously I had shown that if black plays the move pawn to c5, then white generally doesn't have anything better to do than to play e takes d5, and black will play e takes d5, and this is an exchange variation, where white has played bishop d3 and black has played c5. I've, and this is fine for black, this is all well and good. However, there is one option that I forgot to mention, that white can play, which you know, has been played before, but it is very rare. So I felt that for the sake of completeness, I should talk about that. And that is that whites can play the move pawn to c3. Now, before continuing with that, I thought I should just mention some of the ideas of the move pawn to c5. Basically, black is putting pressure on white's center, and in particular is threatening to win this pawn. So if white now plays pawn to e5, then black can just take the pawn. And similar thing with other moves. And if white plays e takes c5, then this is no good because, you know, black will most likely be removing white's ability to castle. Like, this is just not a happy position for white to be dealing with. Like, white can try something like bishop to b5 check, but black can play bishop to d7, and black is pretty happy to trade this bishop for this bishop because this bishop over here has moved twice, Whereas this bishop has only moved once, and basically this trade will help black with their development. It will help give black a bit of a lead in tempo, and basically overwhelm white with, you know, with pressure. So, well, as a result, there's only really one alternative move for white besides playing e takes d5. Now, white could also play knight to f3. Like, this is okay, it's mediocre, but black is generally happy to just take like this, and white takes back, and then black can play knight f6, and this is kind of like an improved version of um, what white usually expects black to play instead of c5. Because normally with this trade, white would love to put the bishop back on f3, but white cannot do that since the knight is in the way. So this is also fine for black, but... Uh, this is very, very rarely ever played by white, but it's worth mentioning. And like, uh, but anyway, back in this position, white does have one alternative move, which has been played a few times, and that is to play pawn to c3. And this line is not really scary for black. The way to approach this, like one way to approach it, is to just interpret it as sort of a delayed advance variation. Like, basically, black can kind of proceed as if it's an advanced variation, except the pawn has not yet been con committed to e5. Right, so black can kind of just develop as normal, just play on the queen side, and just see what white does. And maybe win a pawn, you know, maybe do some stuff like that. So, anyway, for this game, with the white pieces, we have Grandmaster Mark Bluestein who is a former prodigy from Canada. He was a player who obtained the title of International Master at the age of 13, in, and the title of a Grandmaster at the age of 16. And this game, it was played, I think, when he was 14 years old, so he would have been an IM at the time, not a GM. But he did eventually become a Grandmaster, and... He was also the youngest Canadian player to ever participate in the Chess Olympiad. Like, he participated multiple times, and he actually did quite well. I think he was even on board one at least once. And, uh, well, sadly, he retired from chess in 2011, and I think he currently works as a manager in uh, the financial services industry, so... You know, that is, that is just a very sad tragedy. No! Well, uh, 
<laughs> uh, that's all I can really say to about that. I hope that he he's doing well. Uh, sadly, there just isn't that much money in chess, so it's you know very practical decision. Anyway, with the black pieces, we have Grandmaster Jean Marc de Crave, or is it de Crave? Uh, I'm not fully sure. My my French is not that good. And he is a player from um, France. And uh, let's see, he won the France Junior Chess Championship in 1987. And he has also um, represented France multiple times at the Olympiad as well as the European Team Chess Championship. And I believe he won a, a bronze medal on the reserve board in 2004, if I recall correctly. And this particular game was played at the Canadian Open Chess Championship in 2002. Ooh, and um, there isn't a whole lot of information available about that event. All I could really find is just a few games as well as the winner. But that's kind of understandable given that, you know, this is a tournament from the past. And, you know, it was from the days, you know, before everything was being put on the internet and all that. Uh, anyway, more information about the players and the events can be found in the video description. Now, back to the game. So in this position, White has played the move pawn to c3, and things are now starting to look sort of like an advanced variation, except this guy is not on e5 yet. Like, that's one way of going about playing this sideline. So black just proceeds with their development, just playing knight c6, being like, let's add some more pressure onto the d4 pawn. And here white plays knight e2. White could also play knight to f3, like this has been played as well, but kind of a similar idea as before, just take, take, and then put the knight here. And here the bishop could go back to c2, like that's an option. It can also take here, that's okay too. But generally, white is not happy with this. White is not happy with this. So that is why you'll generally see knight's e2 be played instead. So black takes on d4. Since white can now castle kingside, like that rule still kind of applies. And it's even in this weird line. White takes back. And here black's like, you know what? This bishop is on d3, and I think I'll go harass it. I think I'll go try to grab the bishop pair, because where is this bishop going to hide? It can't hide on f1 anymore, because the knight's in the way. So white plays bishop b5 check, black blocks with their bishop, and white takes, and black takes, and black is doing pretty well here, because, you know, black's got more of their pieces out, black's got good control of the center, like, the position's still fairly even, because white is the only one who can castle kingside at the moment. But that might soon change, so black's doing pretty well. In this position, you know, this pawn is kind of under attack. So white decided to now just play pawn to e5. And now things are looking kind of like an advanced variation. So black played knight to e7. You know, typical idea, putting the knight on f5. Like, black isn't too concerned with knight a3, knight c2, because black could just trade, either if black really wants to, or maybe even just put the rook on c8 to stop the knight from coming to c2. Like, that's an option as well, so black's not too worried about that. White decides to develop their knight to c3. Black puts their knight on f5. Black's not too worried about pawn coming to g4, because it's like, well, where's the king going to castle then? You know, stuff like that. White kicks away Black's knight. Black moves their knight back. White grabs some space with the move pawn to b4. But Black's not too scared since Black's probably not going to be castling queenside anyway. You generally don't want to castle queenside when you've got a nice open c file ready to hit your king like that. So White now castles kingside. Black develops their rook. Rooks belong on open files. Not kings. Kings do not belong on open files. Anyway, queen goes to d3. Black plays f6. You know, this is a common idea in the advance. Sometimes black does go for this pawn break. I think, let's see. Also a few other variations as well. I think in the classical as well, black sometimes does that too. 
White now goes pawn to g4. Black's like, eh, how are you going to get my knight off of h4? Now that spawn's a little silly. You might be overextending here. White plays f4, trying to attack. Trying to attack black. But black's like, okay, you didn't take my pawn, so I don't have to worry about officer or anything. So I'll just play pawn to f5 and try to keep the center closed because, you know, black's king is here. Here, and so here... White's like, hmm, I probably don't want to open the g-file, so I'll play pawn to h3. Black's like, well, I think I'm happy with this trade, taking like this. And one thing that's interesting here is that since black has not yet castled, black's not necessarily too scared about this attack since black's king could potentially, you know, hide like over here if, if need be. Probably doesn't, you know, want to be running their king. Like, there isn't really any need to do that at the moment, but, you know, at the same time, White's attack is very double-edged. Like, White seems to be more weakening their king than actually posing problems for Black's king. So, anyway, Black plays pawn to h5. I mean, like, yeah, I'm not scared of your attack. My knight does a good job of covering this square, so there's no queen coming in like that. So bring it on, I'm quite happy to open this file and maybe get my own queen over there or something. You know, do stuff like that. White plays g takes h5. Black puts their knight back on f5 because it wasn't doing a whole lot on h4, it was kind of actually getting in the way of this rook. White plays king g2. Black puts their bishop on h4. The bishop, on the other hand, is doing some stuff. It's restricting white a bit. It's potentially taking away squares from the king. It's potentially taking away the g3 square from this knight. You know, all sorts of good stuff. White plays knight b5. Perhaps getting ready to put their knight on d6. And black's like, hmm, I really like my knight on f5, so I'm going to move my knights here. And I'm not too worried if white takes this pawn. In fact, taking this seemingly free pawn is actually the best move for white, according to the engine. Like, the engine really wants, you know, this to happen. Where this knight is a bit oddly placed. Like, white has won a pawn, but um, basically what black can now do is after a4 play king f8 and then basically play queen e8 and then something takes this guy and then maybe something else goes here like maybe the rook takes this guy and then the queen comes to this square on g6 and we start attacking white's king this bishop does a good job of stopping anything from coming to g3 that is part of the reason for it and this rook does a good job of just stopping anything from coming in on the queen side so that is one way that the game could have continued, but that is not what happened in the game. Instead, black played knight c e7, and white did not take this pawn. White instead just played pawn to a4 right away. And black's like, okay, if you're not going to take the pawn, you might as well just get your knight out of there. White played uh, knight d6 check. Black took it, because that looks like a free pawn. Yum, yum, yum. Take, take. Knight f5. White plays pawn to b5. And here, black makes a bit of an inaccuracy according to the engine by playing rook takes h5, but I think this move is fine. Like, the engine really wants black to play queen f7 first. It's a little bit unclear why, but I think rook takes h5 is still perfectly fine. Like, the difference goes from, like, minus 4 to minus 2, and it's like, that's still a winning advantage. Like, black's still perfectly fine, so this is not a very serious inaccuracy. White plays b takes a6, black just takes back because this queen should really not be leaving, you know, the king alone like that. That's very dangerous. So in this position, uh, white played bishop a3, and here black really should just play queen f7 and just checkmate the king. Like, maybe this is a style thing, maybe white, uh, sorry, maybe black is more of a positional player and doesn't like these wild attacks and stuff, but basically white's king is in a lot of trouble here. Like, I don't think white's king can survive this attack. Like, basically the queen comes to g6, the king goes to f3, and then maybe black can even play something crazy like 
bishop e1 and how would white deal with the problem of rook h3 check picking up the queen or potentially mating white you know nasty stuff like that uh, but anyway that's not what happened in the game instead it seems black got a little scared and just played king f7 which is an okay move it's not a serious mistake or anything like that white plays rook fc1 black decides to trade and now here is where black does make a pretty serious mistake black should as i mentioned before just go for the attack like how is white going to stop it how is white going to defend against this attack i don't see any nice way out of it for white just seems very straightforward but instead black's like nah i'll just take a pawn and it's like suddenly you know black's advantage it starts to vanish it starts to go away here because, you know, this knight was very, very strong on f5. It was doing a good job of restricting white's queen and, you know, just helping control the g3 square. All that good stuff. I was like, nah, I just want free pawn. Yum, yum, yum. And we see that most of black's advantage kind of went away. Like, black's still a little better, but not by as much as before. Like, black's just slightly better now when before black had a winning advantage due to that attack. Anyway, we have rook, rook a8. It's just kind of, in a way, kind of undeveloping their pieces, like being very defensive. Being super solid, as the as today's players would say. But for me, solid is a dirty word. Solid is uh, synonymous with afraid. It's synonymous with fear. You should be solid when you are up material and you just want to consolidate, which I guess black kind of is. Black is up one pawn, but uh, why be up a pawn when you can be up a king, you know? Anyway, pawn to f5. We have queen to b8. I like this, you know, just attack, attack the king. And here, white makes pretty serious uh, mistake that basically kind of lost the game which was to play queen to g3. This was kind of the wrong way of defending. The proper way was to play knight to g3. This would kind of hold everything together, although you kind of have to be an engine to see all this. Like, this is crazy stuff. Like, we would have queen b2 check, king f3, and then, like, e5 or something takes... Oh, look, a free rook. Yum, yum, yum. Takes, and then these two pawns are monsters. And then, according to the engine, white, sorry, black would have to give up their rook. And then, white doesn't even take back. White just takes like this, you know, winning a pawn because this rook's not going anywhere due to this pin. We would have this here, this, check, this, and then this is just a draw because basically the knight will be able to give itself up for the pawn at some point. All right, like either that or we get like a king and pawn end game. Like basically the knight can probably just sit on a light square or somewhere where the bishop can't get at it. It's things like that. So this this would just be a dead draw. But this is not what happened in the game. And honestly, I think you need to be an engine to see all this stuff. See this entire line. Instead, what happened in the game was white played Queen g3, which looks okay, but is not. And if you want, you can pause the video and see if you can find black's next move. You can see how black continued the attack. How did things now go? I will reveal the move in 3, 2, 1. So black now continued with queen b1. Just going to h1, you know, stuff like that. Or maybe bringing the rook to h1. Like, you know, a number of choices here. Like, Black's attack will be successful because after F takes E6, check which happened in the game, Black can hide their king on H7, and the queen over here does a good job of defending this diagonal. Like, that's an important thing to keep in mind when it comes to uh, king safety and shelter. Like, this is a uh, major piece endgame. It is an endgame where we've got queen and rook on the board. board. And um, basically, in endgames like this, like where we've got queen and rook and maybe something like a bishop, 
or maybe another rook. King safety is much, much, much more important than material. Like, you can even, like, sacrifice material sometimes to win. And, like, basically, the reason why this is minus 7 is because this king is safe. This king is hard for white to get at, whereas this king is basically going to die. Like, even if white had, like, extra pawns over here, like, two extra pawns over there, it would be irrelevant. And, like, this guy is going to die. So, that's a very important thing to keep in mind about these kind of end games. Games. Like, in other end games, games you want to activate your king. You want your king to join the battle. You want your king to participate in your plan. But in major piece end games where you've got, like, queen and rook and something, the king wants to just hide in a bomb shelter and wait for things to get traded off or wait for you to win in some other way. Anyway, so the king just hides over here. And in this position, it's very hard to find a move for white. White is just very, very dead here. Or, like, white is stepping into a mating net. And so, in this position, white just played the move king f2. This is a very anticlimactic way of uh, the game ending. If you want, you can pause the video, although I don't think you need to pause the video in order to find uh, black's next move. It's basically black to move and make white resign. So it's a resigns in one puzzle, if you prefer. And so the move was just, final move of the game was just bishop h4, pinning the queen to the king, and just going to take the queen, you know, just going to get rid of it, and yeah, everything's hopeless. Like, black will be able to stop this pawn. This pawn's not a problem for black to deal with. Like, there are so many checks and forks that that pawn will just fall. But uh, anyway, I think that will do it for this game. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Bye for now.